I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I know school is ending, although um, Bob tells me he has school to next Friday. So sorry about that, Bob. Um, who's here today? Who, who's on the call? Are these uh, from all over the United States or? Yeah, let us know in the chat and do a quick introduction to yourselves in the chat. I mean, I recognize a couple of names, you know, Bob Gilmore, uh, nice to see you, Betsy, Stephanie. It's been a long time since we've gotten together. It's been years at this point, I think. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Yes, it has. Yeah, thank you. Cindy Strike, how are you? Oh, Cindy's here too, great. I'm doing well. Oh, yeah, Cindy. Good, good. All right, uh, let me get started. So, um, Thanks so much. Really nice uh, of you to come and uh, season's greetings. Uh, I'm Janice Gobert. I'm a professor at Rutgers in the School of Education, and I'm also the CEO of Inkits, founding CEO. Um, so today we're going to tell you uh, a little bit more about our system that supports your real-time instruction and real-time assessment of the science inquiry practices known as NGSS, also known as 21st century skills. And it also supports students' understanding or students' competencies at these practices. So we're gonna give you an overview. Uh, we're gonna review some data, but uh, between the overview and the data, Mike's gonna do a great demo. So you'll see what the student sees and you'll see what you see. And then we'll uh, end with a, a Q and A. Um, so on that note, um, let me start. So we're going to tell you about uh, how you can reduce grading and enhance learning with AI-backed virtual science labs. So um, we'll start from the position that the U.S. is very low on STEM, about 18th right now internationally, but we're also very low on um, math, according to the NAEP, and on ELA. And so INCITS provides a great opportunity to hone of course, the science competencies for which it was initially designed. But in our uh, more recent work in the last few years, say four, three, four years, we've been working on helping teachers assess and help, helping students um, hone their math competencies associated with science. So those are principally um, uh, the second and fifth of the NGSS practices. But in addition to that, because students do the culminating activity where they cl do claim evidence reasoning statements in writing and we're auto scoring those, this also is a great context for them to hone their writing skills. And interestingly enough, despite the fact that science is um, in some ways more complicated in content to other domains in which they do writing, the claim evidence reasoning format, because it's structured around a claim evidence uh, reasoning comp three com as three components, actually makes the task a little more well-defined. So what we're claiming and what we're finding is that we're moving the needle for, uh, for students in terms of their science competencies, of course, that was our original goal, but also in terms of students' math competencies. And um, we've been doing some studies about our, with regard to our math work that's embedded in our science uh, assessments. And the data are absolutely fantastic. And we can actually answer some questions about that after. And then we also know that we're moving the needle in terms of students' competencies at describing what they know in words. So on that note, um, so we know that the US uh, is only 18th on science. We're about 37th on math internationally. That's often very surprising to, uh, to people who are not educators, but this is not, not very good, especially when you consider the amount of funding that goes into, um, into STEM education in the United States. And then, as I said, the math NAEP and the ELA NAEP are low. So what we have is um, the next generation science standards also um, kind of echoed in 21st century skill frameworks that are seeking to improve students' competencies at a variety of practices. So you see those on the screen, asking questions, developing and using models, et cetera, uh, planning and carrying out uh, investigations. And you'll see that I have starred some of them as involving math and involving writing. So these are the, are the, um, this is a really nice context in which to develop students' math and writing because people do math about something. You don't do math about nothing, you do math about something. So developing those math competencies in the, in the context of science is very rich and hopefully will transfer to students' math skills in math class as well. 
in addition, people write about something. They write, um, you know, they write about something they've learned, uh, narrative stories, expository text in science. So this is a good context in which to hone their science skills. So we thought we would just um, highlight that for you. But the issue with next generation science standards is that the teachers must provide evidence of these competencies. So this is not a uh, this is not an easy thing to do. And of course, I'm preaching to the converted here because you of all people know how difficult it is to assess competencies. So um, let's look at the typical assessments. So, for example, you might have multiple choice. These are not authentic. They only capture factual knowledge, minimal reasoning. They're easy to grade, but they put kids into four bins, so they're not really personalized in any way. And students can um, can guess. There's a, a high false uh, false positive there. On the bottom left, you have high stakes and summative tests. These rely on multiple choice and open response format items. Feedback is given too late to help students learn. You often get these results in the summer when the students are in fact gone on to the next uh, next grade and students struggle in silence. And then when you have, um, you have something that are commonly used are lab reports with open response. And these capture uh, students' work products because they're handing them in after the, after the fact, uh, but they don't capture the processes by which they come to know or come to understand something. These are difficult and, of course, you know, very time intensive to grade up to 15, 20 minutes per lab report per student. So that's incredibly in, uh, time intensive. And with NGSS, you're expected to do more labs. So, you know, it's, it's a, a very onerous task. And um, what I'm going to present in a second is that lab reports may not capture what students know or can do, partly because of the writing. And that happens in two ways. And I'm gonna unpack that in a minute, but students can pair it. And also sometimes students can't articulate what they know about science and math well in words. And that's particularly the case for STEM concepts. And then the last part are hands-on labs. These often go with lab reports. These, um, we know that students lack the skills to complete these independently. These require equipment and materials, set up time and space, which takes a lot of time. These are difficult to grade. And um, the, the rigor and consistency is very difficult to keep constant. I apologize for the, the barking dogs. Um, they just wanna be in the room. Um, <laughs> so for example, when talking about assessment, here's a class in which students are all doing the same experiments, possibly um, or possibly different experiments, all working at their own pace. So first you see John, right? John is highlighted. John's not even doing the experiment. He's just looking on, all right? And then here's Billy. Billy is a student who can do the science and do the math, but he has trouble articulating what he knows in words. So if a teacher is relying on students writing like lab reports or claim evidence reasoning statements to reflect what Johnny knows and what Billy knows, these two students both and everyone who falls into these two categories will be misassessed. So Billy, the student, who can do all the science but can't articulate it, that will be a false negative because a student actually has all this STEM knowledge but can't articulate it in words. And uh, Johnny, on the other hand, is the student that we thought we think about and we've known about this kind of student for a long time, can kind of parrot what they've read or heard but actually don't understand the science. That will be a false positive. And that's problematic for teachers because that student will get passed along and passed along to the next grade. And they actually don't have the competencies that the assessment is leading you to believe that they have. So that's a problem for the school system, right? Because eventually the student will hit, hit a wall. So both of these students are, are at risk. And um, we've shown, and I, I wrote about this in US News and World Report, they picked up the story from us that if you rely on what kids write as your only assessment, you're misassessing them between 30 to 60% of the time. So that's extremely high error rate, right? Imagine that 30 to 60% of the time. So we, we clearly need to help 
to develop better performance-based assessments that will capture the full range of competencies that, that students need to learn according to NGSS and 21st century skills, and also the, the competencies that you need to measure. And also because many, many students develop these competencies at very different points in their, um, in their science education experience. And as we know, kids on IEPs or in special ed have much longer learning trajectories. So being able to assess students in this very fine grained way provides you really fine grained data to report out how students are doing, which is um, required if you take ESSER money, Title I money, et cetera. All right, so here's a little bit about the system. INCITS are virtual labs that assess and personalize science, their physical life and earth science grades four through 10, their standards aligned content, and they address students' difficulties with science inquiry, with the math used in science and with the writing used in science. They're, they're faster, rigorous, both class-wide and individual assessment. They're used for both formative and summative purposes and used for differentiated instruction. There's no installation required. Um, only all that you need is a web browser and internet access. It works on iPads, Chromebooks, PCs, Mac, uh, Mac laptops, etc. And they're integrated with Google, uh, Google Classroom and with Clever. So what we uh, here's an overview to the system. And by the way, uh, INCITS is currently um, in use in 50 states and uh, 57 countries. Approximately 1.5 million labs have been done to date. <clears throat> and this provides a way for you to streamline assessment more rigorously and efficiently. So starting on the bottom uh, left, you see the student works in the platform. There's a full platform that works um, to hone students' skills and competencies aligned to the next generation science standards, where they form a testable question and go through the whole inquiry cycle. While they're working, we're tracking absolutely everything they do, every mouse click, every selection, everything they type, every change to the simulation as they conduct inquiry aligned to the next generation science standards. Our algorithms are assessing them in real time and the virtual tutor, Rex, is jumping in to help them when the system detects the student needs help. You have a choice to work, uh, to run with Rex or not. And this, the report will tell you how many Rex hints a student got on each practice. Simultaneously, you're getting real-time uh, reports that do all your grading for you. You, we also have an alerting dashboard. Excuse me, an alerting dashboard called Ink Blotter that will give you alerts as to what uh, what students need help and exactly how to help them in the form of these tips. These are called teacher inquiry practice supports. And those were developed using research that showed that what teachers said led to demonstrable improvement and transfer of students' inquiry practices. So we honed that, that information from our research and put it back in the form of tips. So you have this actionable data and you have this um, very fine grained um, support about how to help individual students. So I'm gonna drill down a little bit on that uh, in a second. So for students, we have authentic inquiry. We have a personal tutor. We have Spanish glossaries and Rex help in Spanish, by the way. And then we have student reports. So students like to keep an eye on how they're doing. Um, for teachers, we have these whole class reports. We have individual student reports. We have full co-teacher functionality. This is useful for paraprofessionals. If you co-teach in science or math, it's also useful for uh, substitute teachers. And then, as I said, uh, we also have this ink blotter device where what you get are these tips and alerts. So the alert might say, so-and-so is having trouble with thus and such, collecting data. You click on that and it will tell you the, the, the actionable information. You can also click down a level and get a tip. And the tip will give you, there's four different tips here. 
orienting, conceptual, procedural, or instrumental. And you can either use them in the order here from left to right, or you can make strategic decisions. For example, if you have a really high level student, you might just give him or her the conceptual support and see if they can figure out the strategy themselves. Like if they're collecting uh, unconfounded or collected confounded data, you might say, well, how will you know about the effects of X on Y? Whereas if you have a student who frustrates really easily, for example, you might give them the instrumental hint. With the instrumental hint, <clears throat> this is the sort of the more very focused, very detailed support of what the student needs to do. But what you might do, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if you do that, is ask the student, how is this different from what you did? Um, or what you were doing. So that's what gets reified in long-term memory. So on that note, I'm going to um, stop my share and I'm going to ask Mike to do a great demo. He's gonna show you what the student sees and he's gonna show you what the teacher sees. All right. Okay. Let me. You might have to make him host, right? Yep, I will need to be host. Okay. Hang on one second. Um, so Let me see if in, I can... in, in true format, uh, I'll reclaim host and then make a post. So let me do that. Okay. I'm host. And now let me make it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Now Mike, you are host. I am now the host. Okay. Let me screen share in its entirety. Hopefully everybody can see my full screen now. Yes. Excellent, yes, it even says you're screen sharing. Okay, let me see if I can get this thing up. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm going to basically all the stuff that Janice said, um, I realized there was a lot of information packed in there uh, pretty tightly. And uh, I'm gonna try and just show you each piece of the system and talk about all of the things that Janice had mentioned. Um, in a nutshell, right, in a nutshell, the real innovation and the, th and the key part that we're working on, right, is the ability to grade what students are doing when they're, when they're using virtual labs. So how they're getting better at science practices, demonstrating science practices. And I'm gonna show you the power of what this assessment can do, or the power of uh, real-time assessment can do. And so what I like to do is sort of start off from the inside out and demo this. Uh, from the perspective of a student, just from an individual lab. What does an individual activity within INCATS look like? And we're gonna talk about one particular example here, uh, trucks, it's Newton's second law of motion. And it starts off with a quick introduction. So it says here that this virtual lab will help you explore multiple factors that impact how fast a truck travels one kilometer. And in the simulation, you're gonna be able to uh, measure different aspects uh, the acceleration, the velocity, so on and so forth. And you can manipulate different factors involving the truck. So the mass of the truck, its acceleration force, uh, and the amount of friction or the roughness of the road. So after students have read the quick introduction, then they would go on and do any number of labs. And in this particular sequence, uh, we're gonna have Rex active. So he'll jump in and provide some support if there are any difficulties along the way that students might have. And so this particular lab has a goal here, determine how the mass of the truck affects the acceleration of the truck. And we try to pick and choose not just the content areas, but also the particular goals to elucidate specific student misconceptions with that content area. And these are also meant, meant to hit the disciplinary core ideas they found in the next generation science standards. So students are always involved in doing inquiry or, or uh, inquiry processes, uh, practicing their science practices in the context of a DCI, in the, con in the context of, of some phenomena that, that's found in standards. So all of the activities have a similar look and feel where they're going to start by forming a question, collecting data, analyzing data, and then doing a claim evidence reasoning write-up. We have some alternative flows as well for higher level students that involve graphing, fitting best fit uh, with best fit curves, and we can talk a little bit more about that later if there's any questions. But just to start off, what a typical, say, middle school activity looks like would be something like this. So students are first tasked to try and make a testable question. So they might say something like, well, if I increase the mass of the truck, well, let's see, what we'll say the acceleration, we'll say that it'll stay the same. It has no effect on it. 
So looking at this, I've specified a relationship between variables. I've specified uh, an independent variable that I said I'm going to change, a dependent variable that I'm going to measure. So even though it might not be scientifically accurate, this is a testable hypothesis, and it's also aligned with the goal. So a student would be getting full credit for this aspect of their uh, investigation. Once they've completed, they now have to try and collect data to figure out if their hypothesis is supported or not. And so here they might change any number of simulation variables and students who are typically uh, less adept at this sort of thing, they're gonna change all the variables that they can kind of play around with the simulation and not really be systematic in how they're collecting their data. And what's happening behind the scenes here is that Rex is sort of watching all the choices that I'm making, picking and choosing. And if there's any sort, if it detects any sort of difficulty that the student might have, it's gonna jump in with appropriate supports to try and help them out. So for example, here, uh, Rex says, well, I think the data you're collecting won't help you test your hypothesis because you are designing a controlled experiment. And at this point, you can ask Rex for some more set, for more help. You can try and fix it on your own. And if you keep making the same kinds of mistakes over and over again, the help gets more and more targeted. Similarly, you can imagine that like there's a million and one different right or wrong ways that students might be going about collecting data, right? And so the system tries to disentangle and figure out, like say, is it a difficulty with them designing controlled experiments? Are they not targeting the variable they said that they test in their hypothesis? Are they running too many repeated trials? Do they only collect one piece of data? Uh, do they have enough data to graph, right? There's all these different ways uh, that students could be going awry in their data collection process. And the system jumps in and provides the personalized help that students need to try and help them get better at each practice. So for example, here, planning and conducting investigations. So for the sake of the demo, I'm going to collect some uh, data that's controlled here. And you'll see that uh, when I, once I do that, Rex will let me move forward. Okay, great. Now I've got some control data with respect to the variable that I said I was going to test the mass of the truck. And then the next part here is that we're going to have students form a claim and back that claim up with evidence. And so what a student might say here is, well, let's see what happens. When I increased the mass of the truck, then the acceleration of the truck, what happened? It looks like it decreased. And so this does not support my hypothesis because I said it would stay the same, right? And so this is a great opportunity here for students to sort of debunk their original thinking uh, and show that they've actually figured something out by collecting their data, right? And I also need to pick and choose which data I'm going to use to back up my claim. And so again, you can see how students might go awry in, awry in many, many different ways. They could be mixing and matching their independent variables. They might not have the correct uh, relationship between the variables that's in the data. They might only pick one piece of data for their evidence. They might be picking confounded data, right? So they might not have backed up, uh, supported their hypothesis correctly or not. Maybe they've had a, there's a, a, a misalignment between the two. So there's many different right or wrong ways, again, that students might be doing uh, this, this portion of the activity, right? And you can see here that this is a very rich performance assessment because of all the, all the ways that students could be engaging in this kind of activity. Once that's complete, students uh, re-represent what they've done in their own words using a claim evidence reasoning write-up. So they need to uh, elaborate on what their claim was, what their evidence was that they used to support their claim, and also tie in some of the scientific reasoning around why, uh, why they experience what they experience with the phenomenon of the simulation. So one really unique thing about this system is that not only is it automatically grading what students are doing, and you saw the you saw some examples of that when Rex was able to jump in and provide some support. So it's grading not only what the students are doing, but for select labs that we offer, about 50 or so labs that we have, it's also automatically going to grade these things that students are writing up, their claim evidence reasoning write-up, so the text that they write. So you actually are gonna get an index not on what students are able to do, but also what they write. And the idea, right, and this that Janice had mentioned before, is that students may be good at one aspect of, sci of the science practices and not the other, but you really want to grow both competencies, the doing and the writing. 
This part of the activity is also very important coincidentally because re-representing what, re what you've just done in your own words is actually really beneficial to learning. And we've shown that students who engage in these kinds of writing tasks uh, are able to remember things and uh, have deep robust learning even months later. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude uh, with this part of the demo just to give you folks just a sense of what an activity looks like. So from the student perspective, we have all different kinds of labs available um, spanning physical life and earth science that are actually searchable uh, by NGSS standard, by DCI. And within each lab topic, we have multiple driving questions. So you saw an example before of just one driving question, but each sort of lab topic area comes with a package of them. And you can assign any one or any multiple number to students. You can assign them multiple times. Uh, we also have content pre and post test questions available that you can assign if you like. And built in as well, uh, students also get uh, some documentation that shows Spanish support. So for students who might be struggling, uh, struggling with English, we have some Spanish support available and also expectations about how, how, what, what's expected of them to do in its activities and for claim evidence reasoning. And all of this sort of uh, infrastructure is built into the system. So you've sort of seen one aspect right now about what auto grading can do, right? Giving students support, but what else can it do? So for teachers, we have reports that show not just how students are, uh, they show not just um, how individual students are doing, but how the class is doing as a whole. So let me pop up real quick here and show you a more detailed report. Here we go. So after students have done a number of activities, you get a summary showing how students did on all the different aspects of inquiry. So for example, how do they do it explaining findings or, or forming their questions? And the more yellow you see, the more difficulty students are having, the more dark blue, the better they're doing, right? So you can really see at a quick glance what's going on. You can also see how much help uh, the virtual, uh, virtual agent is giving and also individual student performance at a glance. You can drill down a little bit further even and get really detailed information about each individual student. You can see not just their scores, but what they did with, with and without Rex help and you can also see exactly the criteria, the rubric that, that is associated with each aspect of our science process. And you can get some details too about how things are actually scored. So for example, here for claim and evidence and reasoning, right? You get a full detailed breakdown of what we're expecting for the claim, the evidence and reasoning when students are writing this up and detailed information is available, right? So this is a great way to see that how the grading is sort of standardized across the activities and standardized across teachers and for students as well. These are printable. Uh, students have access to this as well, uh, so they can print out their labs. Uh, coincidentally, students can also see their, their, all the data that they collected, and this is uh, importable into different spreadsheets. So we've actually had students uh, import their data into Excel or uh, Google, Google Sheets for extended analysis. Our reports also let you track individual student growth over time. So you can see uh, over time, the more dark blue that you have, the better students are doing, right? And this is sort of a typical, tra typical trajectory that we might see where students might be struggling a little bit at first, but with repeated exposure, as you're gonna see uh, later on in our presentation, with repeated exposure and help that students are actually, all kinds of different students, even at-risk students, get better at these kinds of complex skills, these complex science practices. So the last uh, part that I wanna demo real quick uh, is an example of our alerting dashboard that's also built in. So while students are working, you as the teacher or your co-teachers can sort of have this magic crystal ball that lets you watch and track what students are doing. And when students are struggling, it'll tell you not just who is struggling, as you see here, a list of students that are struggling, but when you click on their name, it'll tell you how. So for example, here, Dakota Fields is struggling uh, to conduct controlled experiments, or they're conducting controlled experiments but not testing their hypothesis. Um, Bryce Carhart uh, attempted to start an analysis without enough data, right? So it's giving you this sort of diagnostic piece of information that you can use to help your students. So then at that point, you can decide, well, maybe my co-teacher is going to help me, or maybe I have, I'm have i running with my virtual agent, Rex, and so Rex is going to help them. But if not, I maybe I'm going to go over and help those students, help my students as well. 
And if you're not quite sure what to say, we have built-in tips that sort of give you some uh, discussion prompts that keep you focused on the science practices and give and help you to engage your students in dialogue that helps them get better at science practices. And as Janice had mentioned earlier, that these tips, this, these feedback were built in based on some rigorous research in which we actually listened to what teachers were telling students and we triangulated that with how students were doing in the system and found out that these sorts of prompts that the teachers were giving were actually beneficial to learning. You also have class-wide alerts. If enough students are struggling, a class-wide alert will pop up and tell you uh, with, the, with the particular practice. So it's a good time to stop the class and have a discussion about that aspect of the scientific process. And with a tool like this, we've demonstrated that you can help twice as many students more effectively, right? So you're able to go around the class and engage twice as many students and actually be more efficient and effective helping them. So when you put this all together, uh, this is all packaged together in a web platform uh, that uh, does not require any installation. You don't need any plugins, works across all devices, whether you have iPads, Chromebooks, uh, if you have uh, just normal uh, laptops or computers. Everything is saved automatically on the web when students work so they can do something in class and then take it home for homework automatically and do it on their own computer. Uh, we integrate with Clever, so you can have, if you folks use Clever out there, you can integrate with Clever to get students signed in immediately. We also have a very deep integration with Google Classroom, where you can post assignments, and all the grades that Inkits generates, all the scores that Inkits generates, can get automatically imported into your Google Classroom gradebook as well. So we have all of this infrastructure built around the labs and the auto grading to sort of support your digital classroom flow as well. So we had a question in the chat um, regarding which items can be printed in case students need hard copies. Oh, uh, so the labs themselves, uh, the labs themselves are meant to be done online, but you can actually print them out. Uh, all the questions as well, uh, the pre and post test questions, those can be printed as well, but they're all meant to be done online. Uh, all Wait. of the supporting documents are also printable. Do you mean as the student's lab report? because the, the student can download and print their entire lab report. Yeah, yes. I don't know exactly what um, I read uh, my, my question was, um, if, if we could print out like activities, there's sometimes that I have, um, I work in special education, so I do have students sometimes that work better with the hard copy versus um, online all the time, or if they're absent and the parents don't have, um, the internet isn't that great when they're working online. That kind of stuff. So I was just wondering if we could get hard copies of anything or what exactly could be printed out as a hard copy. That's a good question. So the labs, them, so the, the interactive labs themselves, um, I think you can print out screenshots of them, but they are meant to be done online because of the way the assessment is done and all the choices that students are doing. They're all meant to be done online, but we do have um, our pre and post tests, our content questions, and they tend to be multiple choice or fill in and those can be printed out and done in hard copy. And all of the supporting documentation as well, this is all printable as well. Um, it's also worth mentioning too, that if you have students who are struggling uh, with reading, uh, that we support uh, Chrome plugins. So if you have a Chrome plugin that reads to students, all of the text is selectable. So it'll actually read the text to students as well. If that's something that, uh, if your students are struggling with that aspect. I wanted to add something as well. Um, there's a school that um, that we work closely with that um, uses inkits in special education, and um, they've developed some uh, paper and pencil sort of a guidance that goes along with the activities. And I can find out if if um, those are shareable, and if they are, uh, I can send them to you if that would help, Miss Espinosa. Yeah, that's also a great thing to incorporate in the system. And yeah, thank you for these questions. And just so, uh, you know, this is a, a great example too of how we like to collaborate with our users too, that great ideas come from you folks and we're always listening. Uh, that's how we decide what features next to build uh, based on what aspects would make teachers happier, make the system better to use. So, you know, thank you for, thank you for that question. It's, you know, something that we can definitely put, in the, put into the system, but for short term, yeah, uh, it's something that we could find out if we can send along. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Please yeah, send an email stuff. to Caitlin if you want those materials, those uh, materials that, that come from the resource classroom that I'm referring to. Um, great, okay. thank you. 
So at this point, I'm going to stop the demo. Uh, and at the end, uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, Janice will give you some information about how you can try these labs with your students uh, right away. Okay. So let's see, I think I have to give you a host, correct? Yes. Uh, let me know when you're ready. Yes, let me find you in the list of people. Oops. You might be able to reclaim host again if that's easier. <laughs> Well, Zoom just did an update, so I'm not actually not even used to this version of the interface. So I'm a oh, little there you confused. Go. Yeah, I just made her host. <laughs> Great. Okay, so let's flip your slides back on, Janice. So we'll it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Um, try as I might. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see a blank screen that says demo? No, I see uh, the slides, the, the list of all the slides. Okay. All right, hang on. Um, let me do this. Um, see when I when I um, told you that I was going now, now do you see it? Nope, we see you. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, at least you see me. Sorry about that. Um, Caitlin, could you give me some guidance here? <laughs> um, so share your screen. Okay. Okay, and then share. Oh, I mean, and then I'm, put it in view. Exactly. Right. Okay. Good. Sorry about I mean, that. Was, oh, wrong set of slides. Yep, so just swap flip, displays. Swap like displays, swap. then you're good. Oh my goodness. Awesome. Okay. okay. Now just good scroll job. down to the right. <laughs> and then go to the right slide. <laughs> no. It's not even Friday. I know. And I haven't been drinking, just so that you know. <laughs> oh my goodness. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> been a long day today okay here we go okay great all right so um so inkits is used in many ways so for example for formative um classroom practices uh, sorry formative data on practices dcis and cross-cutting concepts for summative data on these competencies for practices dcis and cross-cutting concepts as a baseline for incoming new students, for example, into high school, or if you have regional feed, uh, regional high school and students are feeding in from various middle schools, that's a great way to get baseline data by INCITS. As a review before your school test or your state summative test, and we've moved the needle for many, many schools up to 20, 22%, where all they did was add INCITS um, as a test prep or INCITS throughout the year and seen great uh, improvement um, as a remediation strategy for struggling students or as an acceleration students uh, strategy for students who need to be challenged. In terms of efficacy, um, our research uh, has shown that um, students are more systematic with hands-on inquiry after using ingots, and teachers tell us that Kids will be doing a hands-on experiment and say, hey, remember what we what we learned in Inkits, that we should target our independent variable and keep the rest the same, for example. Um, English language learners, kids on special education, in special education or in IEPs, show marked improvement, with some students actually leaving the resource classroom and going back to regular science instruction. Um, during uh, COVID, many at-risk kids did better at home with inkets and recs than they did in their regular classroom. And we have a um, we have a paper on that. We also have a paper showing that the achievement gap is reduced with usage. So as students do more and more labs, you have the, the variance, what's called the standard deviation decreasing over time. So those kids who tend to struggle are actually catching up. So that's really, really um, excellent to, to help those students out. As I said before, improve state uh, um, improve state science summative test results. We also show robust transfer of skills to new content areas over long periods of time, tested up to 180 days. So for example, we did this uh, very fine grained study funded by the National Science Foundation where the kids used inkits with Rex, our digital agent. We dropped out Rex, and then over several iterations, we retested them, and we showed that the skills were robust across content areas, new content areas, 40 days later, 40 days later, and then 80 days later, and we tested this up to 180 days. So these, these skills that they're learning are very robust. And then uh, we're really proud of this. 
students tell us that they know ingots is important to their learning. So we um, surveyed, I think, 300 uh, students and we asked them how they liked, <laughs> whether they liked teachers having such fine grained data about them. And um, some of them said, you know, we don't really like it, but we know it's important for our learning. I know it's important for my learning. And, um, you know, we'll take that because uh, school is really about learning. And if kids recognize something is important to their learning, we believe we're on the right on the right track. Um, so in terms of efficacy for teachers, the auto scoring greatly reduces teachers grading time of labs. The algorithms match human scoring with up to 95 percent accuracy. And it identifies those who are simply parroting and those who can do science but not successfully write about what they've learned. So this gives you the way to identify those kids who are just parroting or identify these kids. Think of how frustrating this must be if they can do all this very rich, deep science and math, but then they can't articulate it in words. If they're being graded only by a lab report, that student is going to look much less skilled than they actually are. That's very frustrating to that to that student. Now, regarding instruction, ink blotter alerts enable teachers to give more personalized help to more students more accurately and more quickly than typical approaches. It helps identify students that go un unidentified. So many teachers say, wow, I had no idea that so-and-so was struggling in that way. And then we know that our alerts and our tips, the uh, teacher inquiry practice supports in ink blotter that are used by teachers lead to demonstrable student improvement. So the overarching su summary is that INCITS is designed for all students based on the difficulties that we know that they have with science, what they have with, what they have with math, and what they have with writing. And we designed that system in order to assess those competencies and react in real time when it's most beneficial for students' learning. Um, we know that INCITS helps all students, regardless of gender, SES, ability, et cetera. And INCITS provides learning and transfer of science practices. Now we're, as I said, working on the math and the, uh, the writing as well. The learning of disciplinary content ideas and the learning of cross-cutting concepts in science. For teachers, INCITS and Inkblotter provide automatic, rigorous score, scoring of all students' inquiry processes and competencies and then automatic reports and alerts that allow you to know who to focus on, what needs focusing on, and then tips on exactly how to help them, creating opportunities for deep discourse and equity in the classroom. So we have information here about a free trial. You can also contact sales at apprentice.com if you'd like to have any further questions or do a, a more in-depth uh, demo with your teachers or administrators. And in closing, I just want to tell you a little bit about our um, accolades. We're very excited to uh, have gotten a five-star rating from Common Sense, uh, best product for uh, NGSS by Tech and Learning Magazine. Uh, we won an innovation uh, award by SIA, the Software uh, Information Agency, um, Mass Challenge, et cetera. We had a little appearance as part of a CNN uh, infomercial. We won a Microsoft uh, Civic Innovation Award for our work, especially with Rex. And then most recently, um, I spoke at the White House this August on uh, the future of AI for education. And I'm also on the PISA AI committee because all Perform all assessment is going the way of performance assessment like this. So multiple choice assessments that you that you know are used for state summatives, those kinds of assessments are going away in favor of AI based what's called performance assessment, um, like what you saw today. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, and um, we're happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Yeah, so there was another one in the chat asking if there are specific stages um, for, I guess, for each age group. So does it contain material for six to nine years old and can their parents follow them up or is it just the teacher? OK, so the first part is um, materials for specific age groups. Yeah, like what age groups? OK, yeah. So for many of our activities, we have an intro and an advanced. So the advanced could be used more for high school and the intro could use be used more for middle school. But if you have a really uh, top flight 
um, middle schooler, you could use the advanced activities for those students as well. And recs will help them. So they are, you know, and it's good to stretch students um, capacities um, to give them something that's a little more difficult. Recs will help them and they will learn as they go as they go through activities that are more advanced for themselves. So for age ranges specifically, I believe this is from an international teacher. So age ranges would be, um, I think the earliest we've seen students young as eight years old uh, doing some of these activities up to uh, the more advanced activities, say ages like 16. So ages say eight to 16 or the, the US grade equivalent of say grades uh, two and three for really advanced students uh, up to high school level grades 10 and 11 for remediation. Right. Now the question about, um, can you repeat the question about parents? Um, can parents follow up with them? So I'm assuming if they're they're asking if parents can see uh, the students' inkets or it just the teachers, can just the teachers see it? At present, just the teachers. We have thought about um, a parent portal, but we don't actually have that at present. Correct. Um, a parent is is allowed to log in as a student and can see the student's work as well. If, if, if they choose. That Go feels ahead. like I was just talking to you yesterday. <laughs> You're muted, by the way. I have a question. Um, I'm actually, I've been doing this for quite a while and I, I really like it. And now that we're doing standard base, it, I really like it because now I have proof to show what they're doing. I love the way that you give the kids feedback um, because they get to see where they are and where they need to be strengthened. I like the way that you give those feedback each lab. So what I ended up doing, and I find it supports the kids, is this, where I copied these up. Oh, nice. Mm. And then even like what kind of things, what, what you were looking for. And I've done the flower. And then we just did a, a strength of paper towel where they hands-on did that. And I handed this out. Oh, wow. For them to do that. So nice. I want the, and then Nick, actually I'm sitting here looking at it right now because trying <laughs> to figure out how to do it. And I really, really love what you guys have to offer. I really like it. Oh, the kids you. don't like Rex much, but they have to pay attention to details. That's what a lot of the whole thing is to go back and read and pay attention. So. Right. It's not the first time that we hear that some students complain about Rex. And we uh, interviewed a teacher who told us that, and we asked, well, which students are complaining? And then she thought about it for a second, and she said, it's the kids who are used to the bottom out hint that tells them exactly what to do, but they don't have to think to do that. So they kind of want to get on with the activity without engaging in it deeply. And, you know, that won't, that won't uh, lead to any learning as I'm sure you know. So um, the teacher then said, well, if you don't like Rex, if you pay attention to what Rex is telling you, then Rex won't pop up. And the kids were like, wow. <laughs> it's like, wait, he actually helps you? Actually yeah. helps you. Is, the, is it something like with the reasoning? Cause um, you know, when they have to do a scientific principle where they should kind of, kind of look up to on the computer to see what that actually, the science is behind it. I mean, because we just did that, the weight of paper towel, you know, the strength of paper towel, we did four paper towels and then um, the reasoning, um, they didn't, they really totally missed that. So what would be, and I guess to zone them in and a little bit more of the scientific principle, is it something Great that question. they have to think it through or is it something they need, to, they could look out and bring back in and connect. Well, you mean with respect to that content specifically or any content? Yeah, probably any because, any content. Well, because you know, all reasoning and you, all you could have your students, you know, read, um, read in the textbook and seek to understand the explanation between the data they found and the evidence and, and the, and the theory, I'm sorry, the theory about about you know and how that evidence leads to that theory but a lot of textbooks are not very good at conveying that no and so i would say maybe use it as a as a class discussion point um yeah have, have a class discussion to sort of tease out those ideas and help them learn from one another um 
that might be the best approach. And maybe it's, having them search out the web and kind of like, what did they find out, you know, because they all find different things and then bring it together, have a discussion. Um, okay. That's a great, yeah, that's a great idea. It is the very, it is a very challenging aspect, right? And it's almost like it's a little bit of a rabbit hole. It's like, you know, with one, you find out one thing and then it, it begs another question that you need to find and solve, right? And that's actually not a bad thing, right? So that's how you get, you know, get kids engaged in sustained inquiry, right? But um, it it's a little bit, I think uh, it's a little bit as well of, of, you're covering some of the science content areas in class, right? So you cover some of the topics, right? And in some ways, it's almost like, you could say, well, is this evidence of this phenomena that you've seen, or is it the other way around? Like, you know, because you've seen this, you know, does this is this supporting or or going against what you know about the real world, right? And sort of drawing in a little bit about their own personal experiences, right? Because mm -hmm. oftentimes, right, science goes against the grain; it goes against your own uh, your intuitive thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love the combination yeah. of the. Uh, you know, using this as a guide for hands on. And I, I'd really love to hear more about that. And maybe if you're willing to send, you know, share some data so we can take a look at it, that would be great because we do report out on transfer to hands on. Yeah. Um, so that would be, that would be excellent if you're willing to do that. Well, because this year is going to probably be the stronger of that. Mm. Now that we're out of the pandemic and Mike, yeah. nice to see you again. Yes, it's great to see you too. Looking wonderful as always. You too. <laughs> um, okay. Um, how how would I go about? What is it? What data would you want me collecting? What kind of things? We can talk. We can talk about it offline. That's it. Okay, let's, that would be great. Yeah. We could set yeah. up maybe set up a, an appointment with Mike and and me, and then we could talk with you about it. That would be fantastic because we Perfect. love. Transfer to hands on because transfer is really the brass ring in learning, right? You know, right. someone's learned something when they can transfer it. And that's yes. why we're particularly excited about our transfer, both within system, but out of system. When this impacts students hands on hands on experimentation and hands on labs, we go, wow. And especially when, you know, you're you're using that as a very tight scaffold, which I think is an excellent way to do it. But teachers started, as I said, spontaneously telling us that kids were doing hands on and saying to their partners, like, hey, remember what we learned in Inkits, right? <laughs> we have to focus on the variable that we said we were going to test and keep all the others the same, right? It's the same here. And um, that, you know, we're really proud of we're really proud uh, about that um, because, you know, that's why we're in this business, right? To develop more scientifically minded individuals. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. So I'd love to, to talk with you. Absolutely. I'd love okay. to, I'd love to do that and kind of keep working on that. And okay. I see you have Bet a Betsy's in too. Is she connected yes. with you guys? Yes. Yes, she is. Yes. I have met, I met oh Betsy my God. a long time, long yeah. time ago, long time ago now. All right. Cool. All right. Uh, other questions. I know we just like totally side, side right there for a second. Anybody else? Uh, other questions? No, no, no. It's okay. Thank I don't have a question, but I'm definitely in once I figured out how to unmute my phone and everything else. So great job, everybody. Thanks for including me. I want to see how this how I can help you get this out into the wider world. Great. That sounds great. Thank you. Uh, Bob, I was curious about um, I know you've done some work on, you I know, Bob, uh, I think Bob had to hop off because he messaged that he had to. Oh, yeah. oh that's too bad. So I know Bob has been interested in um, kids data literacy. And now that we have more, um, more, more work on the practices of mathematics, I'd love to talk with him as well about about that. Yeah, he's a very particular, he's a very interesting example, because he's a fifth grade science teacher. Right. And so he's been exposing his students for, for a long time now, year after year, and getting better at data literacy and data analysis and forming questions. And uh, anecdotally from him too, it's uh, when his students leave his classroom, teachers are like, you know, his students clearly have a leg up compared to others. And they're like, what, is, what are you doing differently? No oh, good. It's like, well, I think it's. Does anybody else teach uh, fifth grade or lower? Anybody on the call? No, oh, sixth, sixth, seventh, okay. The reason that we ask is that, um, Mike and I are about to embark on an elementary version of Inkits, and we're very excited to talk with teachers. Like in South America, they use Inkits for as low as third grade, 
And we have some data on second grade as well, where a teacher uses inkits and uses it in whole class mode. So everybody, so she's got it on the screen and they're doing everything via class discussion. And she's honing in on very specific features like observations, like forming, first of all, helping you know, generate questions. Okay, what questions should we test? And then she specifies the hypothesis and then they collect the data as a class on Inkits, and then they discuss the observations and she kind of walks them through. And it sort of sets them up for thinking about science practices for moving forward. But in South America, where they use Inkits regularly and have for many years now, um, the third graders are, are doing extremely well with Inkits and, and they love it. They love it there. So that's kind of interesting. So I'm curious about other teachers who, who use it below fifth grade. So I don't know if you saw the chat, Janice. Um, so Ezra says she teaches fourth and fifth grade and Mrs. Espinoza said that I teach seventh and eighth grade science in a special education classroom. I'm glad you mentioned the whole group as to that is what I would be interested in doing. And I know we have a bunch of research uh, for special education students specifically. So I know Janice could speak on that. Yeah, if you send us, uh, yeah, we, we've actually had kids go back, spend a semester with in the resource classroom with Inkits and go back to the regular science uh, programming. And so we see a lot of really nice data. So if you wanna set up a time to talk about your classes in particular, um, be really happy to do that. I'm a former school psychologist, so I, um, I love to think about this for you know the needs of special special ed population. So absolutely, and I can get you that resource. Yeah, I was going to ask if you if there's a what email address or who would I contact in order to see. Yeah, if you contact, yeah, if you contact, contact Caitlin, then I will find it. I'm sorry. If you contact yeah. Caitlin, yeah, yeah. yeah I can Caitlin, send, just, I can send you an email after this just to let you know that make sure you have my email. Okay. And then I'll ask um, Mrs. Branchek if, if I can share that resource with you. Okay. I think, um, you know, uh, coming up to the end of the webinar and I say thank you everybody uh, for attending. And I just want to, uh, you know, uh, just highlight as well, you know, a little last piece of information is in, in case this wasn't clear that we all are, uh, at least most of us, if not all of us uh, at, at Inkits and Apprentice are education nerds or education researchers. Uh, and a lot of this work has been was founded by Janice and funded on National Science Foundation and uh, Department of U.S. Department of Education work, developing the theory behind how to do these assessments, uh, how to support students, and the research is still ongoing at Rutgers University. Uh, so we're continually looking to get bigger and better, uh, span out to more science practices and more grade levels and more content areas. So, you know, we're really excited. Uh, we hope you give it a try with your students. And if we can support you in any way, uh, please let us know. Uh, reach out to uh, info at inkits.com or sales at inkits.com for some more information uh, and sign up for an account today. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Stay safe and happy stay holidays. well.